Good morning, everyone. As Kathy indicated, my name is Rick Weber. Uh, I am a partner in the litigation department of Bond, Shannon, and King. I practice out of our Syracuse office. Uh, I've been practicing law for roughly 20 years. Uh, a large portion of my practice involves uh, matters related to uh, product liability, and that's the topic that we're going to be talking about here today. Uh, the idea behind this is to give you a sense of what a product liability lawyer looks at uh, when evaluating a product liability case. What are the questions that might actually go to a jury? Uh, what are the factors that might actually uh, impact a determination of a product liability case? And the idea is that if you have this knowledge at the outset, uh, you may be able to incorporate it into how you view your product design and manufacture processes. Uh, so with that in mind, a couple uh, preliminary things. First off, I will just let everybody know that I uh, have certainly presented on product liability before. I did it most recently uh, this past spring uh, to a manufacturing organization, uh, but I did so in a live format. I will confess that this is my first uh, time on a webcast format. So if for any reason, uh, you're not hearing me or uh, something's not clear, let us know uh, and we'll fix it on the technical end. Uh, so with that, uh, I wanna get a little bit uh, kind of to the general overview here. Uh, talk a little bit about some product liability litigation basics. Uh, most of these concepts are probably concepts that you've heard about before. Uh, hopefully you haven't had to hear about them in the context of an active litigation, uh, but they're, they're general uh, constructs that we deal with a lot in the product liability arena. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about negligence uh, as compared to strict liability, uh, difference between design defects and manufacturing defects, uh, as well as component part liability, uh, issues with failures to warn, uh, conceivably failures to guard against potential known hazards, uh, risks of misuse or modification by the end user of a product, and then related uh, claims, contractual waiver and indemnity claims, uh, and contractual warranty claims, and then some recent cases as well. Uh, as you're no doubt aware from the format, uh, you can submit questions at any point in time. Um, and what I will do is, is try to get to some of those questions, although it may take a couple minutes if I'm uh, kind of in the middle of a description here. So uh, with that in mind, let's start by uh, looking at what should you be thinking about as a product manufacturer or designer. The first thing you should be thinking about is obvious. It's your product, it's your idea, it's your uh, dream, it's your business, uh, it's what you've decided to dedicate your life to investing in and developing. Um, from my perspective as a lawyer who counsels manufacturers and product designers, uh, I think what you ought to be thinking about in global terms are, you know, first off, what is the intended use of the product? That's often very obvious, uh, but, it's something that I think from a lawyer, from counselor standpoint, uh, you know, I would want to ask some follow-up questions on. So obviously know your product, as I'm sure you all do. What are the potential unintended uses of the product? Um, a common example that I give, if, uh, if you remember, uh, some time ago now, there was an, a um, rash of what's known as huffing incidences. These were uh, mostly teenagers who were using uh, products in aerosol cans because they were trying to get a high off the can. It was the format in which the product was being delivered. The intended use of the product was not anything they were interested in. They were interested in the ability to get a high off of that product. That's an unintended use, but one that became very clear uh, as there was publicity related to that uh, improper use of those aerosol products. Uh, who are the intended customers? This is useful to keep track of. Uh, your customers may be knowledgeable in the field uh, and very educated users, or your customers may be members of the general public who are gonna rely on specific instructions, uh, directions and guidelines as to how to use your product and what the limitations of your product might be. Uh, what components are incorporated into the product? Uh, if you have a product that is sourcing components from a different area, uh, you know, different country, uh, different manufacturer. Uh, you need to give some thought as to what you're doing to make sure those components uh, are meeting proper specifications at the time they're incorporated into your product. 
Um, if you are a component part manufacturer, you need to be giving some thought as to whether you are meeting the requirements of that product uh, and whether there's anything you can see as the component part manufacturer uh, that might be a potential problem that perhaps the end unit developer has not uh, thought about or not given enough uh, credence to. Uh, also, to the extent that you identify any uh, hazards uh, or any obvious risks of injury, can you guard against that? Can you, uh, Im you know, implement measures to make sure that you've minimized the risks to users of your product? Uh, and then how to test the design. What, what can you do to ensure that the product you are putting on the marketplace uh, meets standards uh, and is reasonably safe for the use that you are intending for that product? Uh, other things to think about, how, are you, how do you go about inspecting or testing as part of your manufacturing process? Uh, have you drafted accurate and complete instructions on use? Uh, oftentimes, those use instructions are contained in the same manual uh, or user guide as warnings. And have you provided full uh, and complete warnings, uh, both in the product literature and on the product in some fashion, if that's feasible? And then have you accurately advertised the product and its capabilities? Uh, generally, a person who suffers an injury stemming from a defective uh, or a harmful product can sue any entity within the distribution chain. That means a designer, a manufacturer, or a, real uh, a retailer. Uh, often what we find is that there are interlocking contractual relationships. Uh, so for example, a uh, retailer who indicates a willingness to sell a product uh, may only do so if there's some level of indemnification by the manufacturer for the sale of such products. Uh, and a, and a common example of this happens oftentimes in the medical field, where there are certain um, prescription drugs uh, designed to address various conditions. And it may be that uh, doctors are encouraged to write scripts for certain medicines, albeit where those medicines are appropriate, uh, and within the proper medical diagnosis of the physician. Uh, but the, that the medical provider, the, or excuse me, the, the producer of those, of those drugs is willing to defend and indemnify physician practice groups who write scripts on those drugs uh, against some kind of harm coming from those drugs. Uh, that's a common scenario and arena in which we, we find that. The main types of claims in product liability are, as I've indicated briefly, strict product liability, uh, negligence, and then the breach of warranty claims. Uh, strict product liability is what I usually think about first as an attorney. Uh, the idea is that an entity can be held strictly liable for any harm sustained by a person resulting from the use of the product, regardless of whether the entity did everything it could to make the product safe and to warn of dangers. Uh, a common example would be an ultra hazardous activity, such as explosives and demolitions. Uh, if uh, for some reason you are in the construction field, and you are purchasing explosives, which happens to be a highly regulated industry, as you might imagine. Uh, explosives are designed to do one thing, explode. And there are all kinds of safeguards put in there. But the fact remains, if you are a construction company and you are engaged in the ultra hazardous activity of blasting foundations for homes, for example, there are obviously a series of uh, hazards that can occur uh, even if the pro even if the the uh, product is used properly and according to its specifications, uh, you'll see on a number of these slides I reference something called the PJI, and so I say PJI and then a number after it. Uh, as a litigator, I identify the PJI as the pattern jury instructions. So what this means is when there is a dispute and an allegation of uh, a product liability claim, product malfunction, a design defect, any of that nature. Uh, that will eventually be distilled after a lawsuit is started and there's discovery and interviews of witnesses and medical records and reviews of product specs and all that kind of stuff. It will eventually, if it's not settled, wind up in a trial and it will wind up in the hands of a jury. Uh, and in New York State, uh, there was a group of judges that got together and formulated what's known as the pattern jury instructions, the PJIs. These pattern jury instructions are the defaults for litigators in trying a case. This is what, uh, as a default matter, the jury will be instructed in when it comes to particular legal topics. 
Uh, there's some opportunity for variation, of course, depending on particular facts of the case, particular judges, particular clients, uh, and, and litigants, all of that. But as a litigator, if I am evaluating a uh, product liability case, and frankly, if I'm evaluating almost any kind of case, I will often turn first and foremost to the pattern jury instructions, because these are the instructions the jury will hear before they go into the room to deliberate on the case. And so there is, in fact, a strict products liability pattern jury instruction. It's PJI 2120. Uh, and what you will see here is that it focuses on reasonably foreseeable purpose. Uh, if a manufacturer or a wholesaler or a distributor, right, uh, the defendant in the lawsuit, sells a product in a defective condition, um, it is going to be liable for injury that results from the use of the product when that product is used for its intended or reasonably foreseeable purpose. A product is defective if it is not reasonably safe. That is, if the product is so likely to be harmful to persons or property that a reasonable person who had actual knowledge of its potential for producing injury would conclude that it should not have been marketed in that condition. Now, what I want to focus your attention on in that regard is this reasonableness standard. Uh, we often refer to it as the reasonable man standard. You'll see reasonableness pop up throughout pattern jury instructions on product liability matters, as well as in negligence matters. The idea is that uh, if a reasonable man would have raised concern about this product before it went to market, that's something that will be basically charged against the manufacturer or the product designer or wholesaler, whoever it may be that's the defendant, in the course of going through this, pro this process, in the course of going through a litigation. So as noted here, uh, a product can be defective as a result of a variety of, of issues. The burden of proving the product was defective and that the, defective was a, the defect was a substantial factor is on the plaintiff. So what a plaintiff would have to do to recover against the product designer or manufacturer in a strict products liability case is show, number one, that the product was defective. It had some fundamental flaw that made it a risk uh, and this defect was um, something that was relevant in the case. But then it also has to show that that defect uh, was a substantial factor in causing the plaintiff's injury. That means it can't be a, a incidental defect to the product, right? For example, if uh, a, an individual is harmed in the operation of a table saw, uh, that table saw may be defective in the sense that it does not have a proper attachment to one of its table legs. Uh, oftentimes on table saws, there are these adjustable bases so you can level the table saw. Uh, the table saw conceivably could be defective if that was not uh, a proper uh, installation or, or properly in place or properly um, able to be used to level the table saw. But if the injury that's complained about by the plaintiff had nothing to do with the label with the leveling, excuse me, of that table saw, it is not going that particular defect will not be a substantial factor that caused plaintiff's injury. So segueing here real quickly for the purposes of overview, uh, another thing to keep in mind is this idea of a negligence claim, right? Uh, we talk about negligence uh, and a wide variety of tort claims. Uh, the vast majority of automobile accident claims are negligence claims. The vast majority of premises liability claims are negligence claims. The idea behind a negligence claim is that somebody has a duty. Uh, it is a duty of care, often again, using this reasonableness, often a reasonable man standard. And then somehow that duty of care is breached. Uh, in a product's li liability arena, it's breached by a manufacturer or a retailer or a wholesale. Uh, that breach is the cause um, of the injury uh, to the plaintiff. Uh, it's similar to what we were talking about on the last slide, uh, where I was talking about proximate cause, right? Uh, and then harm and actual injury. Uh, it's not enough to, in a negligence case, to assert that there was some kind of defect and a breach of duty. That breach of duty has to be the proximate cause of an actual demonstrable injury, something that is legally cognizable and can be recovered from. A uh, quick slide here, just generally on proximate cause. 
uh, cause that is legally sufficient to result in liability and that directly produces an event and without which the event would not have occurred. Uh, I, I make a notation here on chemical exposure cases. I have a, a lot of experience in cases, especially involving lead paint. Uh, and one of the defining uh, uh, characteristics of lead paint cases is that you have an individual who is exposed to a toxic substance very early on in childhood. These are usually toddlers or young children who are exposed, but that there's no immediate adverse uh, impact that is observed from that exposure. There's a record of an elevated lead level, um, but it's not until later on that the, the particular plaintiff begins to experience difficulty in school, maybe is diagnosed with a learning or behavioral disability, something of that nature. Uh, and so the harm itself that is being observed may not actually arise for years. Uh, under negligence standard, a manufacturer owes a duty of care to reasonably foreseeable users of its product. Uh, so what does that mean? Well, um, there are conceivably negligence claims for failure to take proper care in the manufacturing of a product or the design of a product, failing to properly test the product or provide warnings or use instructions on the product. Uh, and then negligence conceivably to take proper care after the par product is in the market and it becomes apparent that a product may be dangerous. Uh, this is where you start to get into the impact of recalls conceivably. If there is a problem uh, with the product, what steps is the manufacturer taking uh, to reasonably alert the, pu the public to a problem with the product uh, and to address that? Uh, we'll discuss a little bit later on about a particular case involving Remington bolt action rifles uh, that got some uh, media coverage, uh, especially through 60 Minutes a few years ago, uh, where this was one of the elements that, that was a potential problem for Remington in the case. Uh, negligent manufacturer, there's a specific PJI uh, related to negligent manufacturing. Uh, a manufacturer of a product owes a duty of reasonable care in the manufacture of that product in part, so it will be reasonably safe for its intended or foreseeable users. Uh, so you can imagine, you know, kind of how that might uh, ripple through a product liability case. Uh, the, the takeaway for a manufacturer is what steps have you put in place to ensure that each a uh, particular example of the product that comes off the product line is meeting appropriate specifications and is fit for use by the end user. Uh, as you can see here from the pattern jury instruction, reasonable care means that degree of care that a reasonably prudent manufacturer of such a product or component part conceivably would use in the making, inspecting, and testing of that product part and its materials in order to produce a reasonably safe product. Uh, there are certainly uh, products uh, that uh, may be um, more likely uh, to be at risk of a manufacturing defect. Uh, for example, uh, if there is a manufacturer of paper towels uh, who, for whatever reason, in the course of manufacturer, erroneously fails to line up the perforated division between paper towels. So those perforated, you know, those perforated divisions are not level, um, are not uh, perpendicular to the edge of the paper towel. There is no likely, reasonably foreseeable, harmful consequence of that. It would be more of an annoyance to the end user. So the need to put in uh, elaborate steps to make sure each uh, of these paper towels is being divided into an exact rectangle may not be that acute, simply because the risk is not that high. A reasonable man would not think extraordinary measures to do that would be necessary. Conversely, if we're dealing with a product that involves uh, a specific chemical mixture, um, to be effective uh, or a specific chemical mixture where one component, one chemical, if added to the mixture in too great an amount could present a risk of harm, there certainly should be an effort undertaken by the manufacturer to ensure that the proper mixture 
uh, is put in place for each of those products. Uh, some of this has to do with a balancing of the manufacturing process against the risk of harm. Uh, again, the continuations of the, of the PJI, specifically a jury will be asked, if you find the product was not reasonably safe, then you'll find the defendant was negligent. Um, and they are specifically charged with making sure and taking a look at whether the manufacturer used reasonable care uh, in manufacturing or conceivably in inspecting or testing the product. These PJIs are shifted a little bit to fit the particulars of each sequence. So as a product liability attorney, uh, if I were counseling you on a product liability matter, one of the first things I would ask is to get a sense from you about what kind of testing protocols are in place uh, in relation to your product before it leaves the factory. Uh, what steps do you do to ensure that the product is meeting its design specs and is able to perform as intended? Uh, before we get to this next slide, I'll just give a quick example of this. Um, we had a case involving uh, an individual who was unsatisfied with a tractor he bought, a farm tractor. Uh, the, he had previously owned a farm tractor that had a higher level of horsepower, was able to do more uh, of what he needed the tractor to do at his particular farm. Uh, he nevertheless, for whatever reason, purchased a farm tractor with a lower level of horsepower. And then he modified it after the fact. He added a front loader to it. Uh, he was dissatisfied because he found that the front loader was not able to uh, accomplish the same level of tasks that his old tractor had. Um, oddly enough, I viewed that as a, as a breach of contract type of claim, although I didn't terribly view it as particularly uh, meritorious. But with that, he had an allegation that because of this problem, he had actually suffered a physical harm. He had suffered an injury because he was forced uh, to manually try to do something that his tractor couldn't do. Uh, and we, of course, uh, pointed out a variety of issues with that uh, in that there really wasn't anything wrong with the manufacture or design of the particular tractor he had ordered. The problem was that he was trying to use the tractor to do more than the tractor was designed to do. Uh, and in fact, there were adequate warnings to show that you should not apply uh, that tractor to do more than in fact it was designed to do. So here's a slide on the three basic types of defects that we deal with in product liability actions. If you are a product designer, uh, obviously design defect is particularly important to you. Uh, manufacturing defect, if you're a manufacturer. Uh, also the failure to warn. Uh, and I'll quickly run through uh, those issues. Um, when a product on uh, a design defect, when a product is manufactured in accordance with plans and specifications provided by the purchaser, well, the manufacturer is not liable for an injury caused by an alleged design defect uh, unless the specifications are so patently defective that a manufacturer or ordinary prudence uh, would be placed on notice that the product is dangerous and likely to cause injury. Uh, in other words, if you are a manufacturer of a product and you are incorporating something that is designed into it, uh, you may in fact not be liable if that product was a defect in design. Uh, if, if the manufacturer is sued, the manufacturer may have a claim back against the product designer. Now, often the product designer and manufacturer is the same entity, uh, but it's worth uh, talking about that. Oh, my apologies, I skipped too quickly. Um, the, on design defect, the designer and, and or manufacturer of a, of a product can raise defenses to claims. And so I wanted to put, put that here and kind of tease that a little bit on this slide, because one of the things that's important to think about uh, and what a lawyer will think about if they're defending you is kind of what are the things that can be raised as defenses? Um, common defenses might include product misuse, uh, assumption of risk by an end user where the risks are known, uh, those kinds of things. Uh, more on design defects here. Um, product is defectively designed if a reasonable person, and again, there's that reasonable man standard, who knew or should have known of the product's potential for causing injury and of the feasible alternative designs would have concluded that the product should not have been marketed in that condition. Uh, again, 
reasonable man standard. Note the second part of this that talks about uh, the, the concept of a balancing of the product's usefulness and costs against the risks, usefulness, and costs of alternate designs. Um, I have an example uh, coming up that I'll show you involving a knife uh, that will kind of be a real-world scenario so you can see how these things play out. Um, again, here, uh, if a jury is looking at a design defect, it's this reasonable man standard. The jury is going to look at this and say, well, wait a minute, if a reasonable man, you know, should, should that product have been on the market as designed? Uh, relevant factors in design defect, again, a uh, whole list of relevant factors. These are straight in the comments from the pattern jury instruction. These are, in fact, questions that I would ask a product designer or a manufacturer about their product. Uh, you know, when I would have an initial meeting, if there's been a claim on a product liability case. Uh, you know, have, have you looked at alternate designs? Why not adopt an alternate design? What about guarding on the product? Have you, did you use a particular guard? And if so, why didn't you use a different guard on the product? Uh, what about this particular container for your product? What about uh, you know, where you put warning labels on the product? Those kinds of questions are things I would ask. Uh, manufacturing defect, uh, I've already covered this a little bit. Again, it's a reasonable care. Uh, in a manufacturing defect, the harm that's being alleged by the plaintiff is something that would result from the product's failure to perform in the intended manner. In other, words, in, in other words, in a design defect case, we're dealing with a product that as designed is defective. In a manufacturing defect case, we're dealing with a product that may be of a proper or appropriate design, but for whatever reason, due to a snafu in the manufacturing process, it was not properly manufactured. So it's not a proper implementation of what would otherwise be a reasonably safe product design. Uh, in a manufacturing defect, it's incumbent on the plaintiff to show uh, that it did not meet the specs or the designs, and that failure to do so subjected the plaintiff to harm. Uh, again, this is a straight quote from the pattern jury instructions uh, on manufacturing defect. I put something in here about component part liability. Uh, obviously, the world is full of uh, products that incorporate components from various manufacturers from various countries. Uh, with various um, functions and oftentimes with various independent quality control uh, obligations and uh, uh, safeguards. So uh, a component part manufacturer can be found liable for a defect in an ultimate product, but there's got to be a, a nexus there. The seller or distributor of the component has to substantially participate in the integration of the component and the integration of the component uh, causes the product to be harmful, and it is that defect that in fact causes the harm to the plaintiff. I had a case uh, in recent years uh, involving uh, what would be described as a, an asphalt hot box. This is a big oven on wheels that uh, municipalities uh, or private companies would use to heat asphalt. Uh, it would heat up asphalt into a form where it was pliable and could be applied uh, you know, to potholes and to road work. Um, that hot box would keep the material hot in transporting it from uh, you know, the, the uh, business office of the municipality or the construction company over to where the product was actually going to be applied. So essentially it was a large oven. Uh, in that particular case, there was an individual who alleged an injury uh, from being exposed to fumes from asphalt. And the claim was that the asphalt had overheated. Uh, a claim was presented against uh, my client, who in fact was a manufacturer of what we call a temperature process controller. That is basically the actual small unit that is inserted into the end product uh, and on which a user would select a particular temperature. Uh, in that case, there's certainly no dispute that the product was integrated into the end unit. However, it, investigation appeared to reveal that it certainly was not the temperature process controller itself that presented a problem. The problem appeared to be that the manufacturer had inserted a certain thermocouple. A thermocouple is basically a large uh, uh, a, uh, thermometer 
it's uh, basically two pieces of wire that touch together and form a circuit when temperature reaches a certain level. Uh, it, it is the device that would tell uh, a temperature process controller when to turn the oven on or turn the oven off. And the manufacturer in that case appeared to have inserted a temperature process controller uh, that, you know, excuse me, a thermocouple that was not then um, properly programmed and linked with the temperature process controller. So as a result, it was certainly possible that the particular asphalt hotbox was operating at a higher temperature level than what was intended or what was reflected on the temperature process controller. But the temperature process controller, that particular component itself, did not have anything to do with it. The temperature process controller was, was performing as designed and was properly manufactured. Um, so that's just an example of incorporating one component into a larger case. Uh, in that particular case and in that particular scenario, the allegation uh, was of a harm from these superheated fumes, but this particular component, even though it was integrated into the product, was not in fact responsible for that problem. Uh, jumping from the component uh, part section I had there, there is in fact, again, as you might imagine, a specific pattern jury instruction on component part uh, liability. Uh, again, the component, uh, the, the manufacturer who uses the component product is under a duty to make inspections and tests as a reasonably prudent manufacturer would in its business. An example I just gave you, it turned out there was a test of the temperature process controller, but it was not in the specific device uh, that was at issue. Uh, I note down here, potential subject for indemnification. I can get into that a little bit later if we, we still have some time left here at the end. Uh, warning defects, uh, if you are a manufacturer or a designer of a product, uh, be sure you're thinking about what you are conveying to end users about the limitations of your product and about the use of your product. Uh, and certainly that you are taking reasonable steps to warn users about hazards, especially hazards that may not be open and obvious. Uh, to go back to my table saw example, a spinning sharp blade presents an open and obvious hazard. Uh, most users of a table saw uh, have probably used a table saw before, uh, but even if they haven't, if they are adults, they certainly have some sense of what the use of a table saw could do. Uh, nevertheless, it is certainly eminently reasonable for table saw blades to be guarded, and this is why you have a series of, uh, they're often plastic uh, hoods that go over these table saw blades, uh, and you can run the wood uh, through that hood, but it's an added barrier between your hand and the spinning blade. Uh, in fact, now on some table saw models, they have a quick stop model where there are sensors that can immediately detect uh, if something comes within the blade that is not in fact the wood and can immediately implement a stop of the blade. In a failure to warn, the manufacturer has a duty to warn against reasonably foreseeable latent dangers that are known by the manufacturer or should have been known by the manufacturer. Uh, also against reasonably foreseeable dangers arising from the unintended use of the product. Again, going back to my, my huffing example, uh, when it became clear that an unintended, uh, and I would certainly argue inappropriate use of certain aerosol uh, cans and chemicals was for uh, individuals to try to get a high off those, uh, it became incumbent on the manufacturers um, who produced those devices to put warnings on the cans, making sure individuals understood they were not to inhale that material. Uh, warnings get a little tricky when we talk about the adequacy of warning, because I, I'm not just talking about the adequacy of warning in explaining to the end user what the risk is and what steps they need to take to protect themselves. Uh, there's also a question of how that's communicated. Um, certainly, the, the communication should adequately apprise the end user of the potential danger, the magnitude of the danger, and how to avoid the hazard or danger. Uh, the example I like to use here is uh, when I was a much younger man, uh, I was on a trip uh, in North Carolina and I decided to go hang gliding. They, they do hang gliding off sand dunes in North Carolina. This is a relatively safe activity. Um, however, I was presented with a waiver and a warning uh, that was about two pages long that essentially 
uh, was designed to make very clear to me that even by walking up the dune with the hang glider, I could probably die. Uh, overkill, perhaps, uh, but I certainly understand as a lawyer why that warning was written in that fashion. Uh, now, in uh, interestingly, that warning also included warnings about a potential uh, problem with the hang glider itself, uh, which certainly wasn't what I was worried about. Uh, we can talk a little bit more about kind of these contractual issues later on if we have some time left. But I, I give that uh, anecdote to, to point out that on some level, you can never be too safe about the amount of warnings that you set forth. Um, you know, and the nature in which you set them forth. And presentation of warnings may be a factor as well. Uh, I had another uh, product liability case in recent years that centered on an individual who was injured from his use of a uh, restaurant grade fryer. Uh, if you've ever worked in a restaurant kitchen, such as a uh, Wendy's or a Kentucky Fried Chicken, uh, they often use these uh, uh, substantial machines to fast fry uh, chicken. Uh, in this particular case, the concern was that the individual was injured when he did uh, what uh, the manufacturer specifically warned he should not do. He put water into the fryer and attempted to clean the fryer using hot steam. And sure enough, it escaped and it scalded him. Um, one of the issues in that case was that there was an allegation that the warnings, although they were sufficiently documented in manuals, on product websites, was that the warnings were not adequately set forth on the machine itself. Uh, as it happened to be, uh, that turned out to be not such a problem uh, for the manufacturer here. Uh, the, the warning was set forth on a steel plate that was affixed to the device itself. Uh, and the individual in question uh, gave some testimony indicating that he had been using restaurant fryers for years and he knew and understood he should not have tried to clean it the way he did. But it raised, I again convey that anecdote to point out that you should give some thought to the placement of warning labels on the product, to the durability of warning labels. Are you using a, a, a one-time ink stamp? Are you using a sticker that gets pulled off and discarded before the product is used for the first time? Are you using a steel plate that is on that product um, for all time? Uh, I will point out there is a uh, reason why automobile manufacturers, especially when they first began to adopt uh, computer screens in cars, would frequently put up warnings um, to users about using those computer screens while a car was in motion. Uh, and in fact, most automobile manufacturers uh, have simply chosen to disable certain functions on their touchscreen devices in cars while the car is in motion. Uh, there is, of course, a PJI on in inadequate warning or failure to warn of certain products. And again, we're looking at uh, a reasonable man standard. Um, uh, manufacture of a product which is reasonably certain to be harmful if used in a way that the manufacturer should reasonably foresee is under a duty to use reasonable care to give adequate warnings of any danger known to it or which in the use of reasonable care it should have known and which the user of the product ordinarily would not discover. Again, reasonable man standard. Uh, interestingly here, uh, this, this is again the direction to the jury. Um, this PJI 2120 kind of handles multiple roles um, about the product being defective and that applies also to the failure to warrant. Uh, I note here causation issues. Again, this is more for the litigator in me uh, than necessarily the product manufacturer or designer in you. Uh, but again, the question that I'm going to have to look at is whether the alleged uh, failure to warn was a cause um, uh, of the injury to the plaintiff in a particular case. Uh, one example here that I, I focus on is, is the end user of your product a knowledgeable user? Uh, the shallow pool example I have is uh, the scenario where you have a shallow pool, pool you have an individual uh, who ordered that pool with full knowledge of its depth, who installed the pool, uh, nevertheless, after a drink or two, took a dive into the pool and fractured a vertebrae in the neck. Uh, these are open and obvious risks. 
the user of that pool is knowledgeable, have you been in the pool before and ordered it specifically for its specifications uh, and has some knowledge of the way gravity works as well. Um, so those are, those are the kinds of things we occasionally face in the failure to warn scenarios. Talked a little bit before about contract claims and the idea of contract intersecting with product liability. And this requires some discussion about warranties. Warranties are representations about what a product can do, what its function is, uh, and how it will perform. There are a couple of different kinds of these things. There's an express warranty. Uh, oftentimes this has to do with the operation of a product uh, and is independent of a straight, strict product liability claim, though many warranties uh, are written to acknowledge that it is the expectation that the end user will get a product that is, in fact, properly manufactured and, and uh, that fulfills its specifications. Uh, so there's a quick slide here on express warranty, quick slide on some implied warranties. The law will imply certain warranties. Uh, those can be uh, uh, expressly uh, dis, um, discounted uh, by express language and express warranty. Um, but the implied warranty of merchantability um, is an implied product that the product is fit, excuse me, an implied promise by the manufacturer or retailer that the product is fit for its ordinary purpose. Implied warranty of fitness is a little bit more different, uh, excuse me, a little bit distinguishable in the sense that in that scenario, a end user is relying not only on a representation that the product is fit for its use, but that it is fit for a particular purpose. Uh, in other words, there's a reliance on the seller's expertise. Uh, think about the example of uh, the tractor I gave earlier. Uh, in that scenario, had the seller of that product made a representation that the tractor with a lower amount of horsepower would do everything that the tractor with a higher amount of horsepower could do, that's not necessarily a product liability claim, but it is related in the sense that there would have been an implied warranty of fitness uh, that had been presented between the seller of the product and the purchaser of the product. So the, the bottom line for product manufacturers and designers is to think about exactly what representations are being made to the public about your product, both by the manufacturer and conceivably by sellers of the product as well. Um, one thing I will point out quickly on that before talking about guarding is that especially in this day and age, we find that products are not only being sold uh, by direct uh, brick and mortar retailers, but are being sold online. Uh, to the extent the products are being sold uh, on a manufacturer's own website, the manufacturer obviously has control over what exactly is presented to the public in the course of selling that product. Uh, however, things can get a little trickier when the manufacturer of the product is interacting with a third party, uh, for example, an Amazon or similar uh, mass online retail. Uh, and in that scenario, obviously, we would caution manufacturers to, to make sure that proper product knowledge, uh, proper product use, uh, instructions, proper warnings, and proper representations are being conveyed um, in the course of interacting with that online uh, product uh, retailer. Guarding against hazards. Uh, this arises when products by their nature are dangerous, even in their intended use. I give a couple examples below. Most of these are fairly obvious. Everybody runs into these kinds of things every day. Uh, and in fact, uh, they, they can be as, as dramatic and as well known as obviously the cutoff switches uh, on lawnmowers and that sort of thing. Uh, but frankly, they can also be as innocuous as uh, a cover, a, a spill-proof cover that you get on a cup of coffee when you're, when you're um, driving through your breakfast drive through uh, If you may recall, there were a series, uh, or not a series, there was uh, some legal action against McDonald's years ago involving the temperature of its coffee. Um, the uh, issue led to McDonald's putting warnings on its cups that coffee was in fact hot and that it was serving it intended to be hot. But those spill-proof tops are also a reasonable measure by McDonald's to make sure that if a spill occurs, uh, it is a relatively limited spill, uh, or at least there is time for somebody who is experiencing a scalding or a, a hot coffee scenario to grab the cup and, and move it. It's not going to be a mass spill of all the, the contents of the cup into somebody's lap. 
So I give an example here. Um, you know, I say what might be the concerns with this product. If I were looking at this product for the first time, I, I would acknowledge the fact that whoever designed it and manufactured it knows this product far better than I will ever know this product. They know exactly the type of content of uh, plastic and carbon that's in the handle. They know exactly why the screws on the handle to the blade are where they are. They know exactly what uh, the, the uh, operating mechanism is of this product. Uh, but one of the things I look at is I think, well, first, this is a product that is commonly used by everyone. Uh, a reasonable man would most likely understand the risks of the use of a knife. Uh, nevertheless, in this particular instance, this is a knife that was manufactured by Buck Knives. Uh, Buck Knives is taking no chances. This is from their website. Uh, they have a series of examples about uh, what to do with a knife and what not to do with a knife. Uh, most of these are obvious, uh, but you can certainly get the sense uh, from the way they are written on the website uh, that a lawyer probably thought it was a good idea to put these warnings on there. Uh, I give that as an example again of, of how you know uh, pervasive products liability litigation could be. Uh, and just to show that obviously manufacturers and designers should be taking uh, all reasonable steps and generally defaulting to be overcautious when it comes to the use of the particular products. Uh, a related slide here, misrepresentation, false advertising. Again, I put this in here um, not so much because it's a strict product liability claim or it has to do with negligence of the product, but because it could open up a product manufacturer or a product designer to a potential product liability claim in the future. I give some obvious examples here, right? Red Bull, Red Bull gives you wings. Uh, Kellogg's Mini Wheats make you smarter. These are things that have been in, in advertising. On the Red Bull gives you wings side, I think any reasonable uh, user of Red Bull would understand they're not going to suddenly sprout wings. They'll understand that's a metaphor. Uh, it's some artistic license, uh, and it, it is part of a marketing strategy it's conveyed, designed to convey a feeling or a general um, a concept of the product as opposed to a literal interpretation. Uh, however, as you work your way down that list, you know I note that Hyundai and Kia uh, have been uh, pursued for misrepresenting car horsepower. Now, does that result in any kind of harm that's a product liability matter? Well, probably not, but one can think about issues if there is an individual who bought a car and who, who had bought the car for a specific representation of horsepower uh, and was making a judgment call on whether they could safely get their car into an intersection before the light changed color and beat another car in there um, based on their belief that a car actually had a certain level of horsepower. Uh, a couple of things on defenses. This is what I look at as a, as a lawyer. So expect that, that me or anyone else who handles a product liability claim for you would be asking you questions about these things. Uh, what is misuse? What is the risk of a substantial alteration of the product by an end user? Um, you know, is there a reasonably foreseeable misuse of your product? Uh, obviously, the individuals at Buck Knives realize that there is a foreseeable use that somebody could use their product to intentionally inflict harm on another individual. Uh, I think everybody in that scenario understands there, there is always a risk that someone could use a harm to a, a knife, excuse me, to inflict harm on another individual. Uh, so they've certainly put forth a warning in relation to that. Uh, I give an example of common defenses here. These are all kinds of things that I would, uh, I would probably want to have a conversation with a product manufacturer or designer about should a product liability case come up. So there's certainly things worth thinking about before a product liability claim arrives. Uh, have you as a manufacturer or designer secured some kind of contractual indemnification? Uh, if you are a manufacturer of a product somebody else has designed, is that designer going to uh, promise to indemnify you against any harms or loss from the product if you properly manufacture it according to specifications? Um, has there been at least some thought to what uh, might be a misuse of the product that's not the most obvious misuse of the product. Um, you know, the, the use of a knife for cutting is an obvious misuse of the product. Uh, the use of a knife conceivably uh, to open a tin can, 
I would certainly argue that that's that that's a reasonable um, potential risk. Uh, but somebody else might not. Someone might say that using a knife as a de facto lever to open a, a tin can uh, may not be something that was reasonably foreseeable. So if the knife snaps in the course of doing that and the individual suffers a cut, maybe there's some risk of liability there. Uh, assumption of risk is a, a doctrine that requires uh, knowledge of the risk. In my hang gliding example, I was knowingly assuming the risk that a hang glider could fall out of the sky. Uh, I was, in fact, knowingly uh, hoping that I could get the hang glider in the sky in the first place. But I was certainly, by virtue of the, the waiver and warning documents that they gave me, knowingly assuming that risk. Uh, and that would be a defense that they would have used had something happened and I had elected to sue uh, this manufacturer. I'm going to skip over statute of limitations. That's really more of something that uh, litigators focus on has to do with the period of time in which a product liability claim uh, can be brought. Uh, indemnity, I've talked about this a little bit. Uh, the Bigelow case I cite here for the principle that innocent sellers who merely distribute a defective product are entitled to indemnification from the at-fault manufacturer. This would be particularly important if uh, an individual suffers harm from a product and he decides to go sue the retailer of the product. Uh, a scenario where an individual uh, purchases a particular uh, electronic component from Radio Shack, back in the days when we still had Radio Shack, uh, the product malfunctions, it causes his, um, his device to catch fire, uh, causes some loss, some damage to his house. Could, he could certainly sue Radio Shack. Radio Shack would then most likely turn around and sue the component part manufacturer. Uh, so indemnification is something to bear in mind. Some recent case law, and, and unfortunately, I don't have a lot of time to get into this. I, I referenced the Remington uh, rifle cases before. These were cl class action lawsuits down south. There's one pending in Louisiana. Uh, the concern was that the bolt action mechanism on a Remington Model 700 rifle had a defect, and it exposed that rifle to an increased uh, and arguably unsafe risk of accidental discharge. Um, that case was ultimately settled with uh, Remington agreeing to retrofit these Model 700 rifles, which have been on the market for a long time, uh, with new trigger mechanisms at no cost to the owner. Uh, again, I cite here the, the Louisiana uh, case in particular that involved particularly a Model 710 bolt action rifle uh, plaintiff was injured when the rifle discharged uh, and it and actually got shot actually through the buttock and into the elbow. Um, there was an allegation specifically about this connector mechanism. Uh, and certainly that's a case that, that's well cited. You can, you can read the details of the case a little bit more. Uh, but there was an argument that the design allowed dirt and debris to accumulate into that mechanism. Uh, and that that would then create this increased risk and that that was an unreasonable increased risk. Uh, the district court granted judgment in favor of the plaintiff. I know that case was on appeal uh, to the appellate circuit. I don't actually know uh, the outcome of that appeal. Um, uh, and, and one of the defenses raised by the manufacturer there had to do with a Louisiana state statute. Uh, Louisiana is a little strange in that they're uh, they don't necessarily uh, follow a case law model. They follow a more strict uh, statute model uh, for their for their legal um, system. Uh, but certainly that's a, a case that's out there, and, and I invite you to investigate a little further. If you have any questions, you can let me know. Uh, I cite the Fosamass product liability litigation. Uh, this had to do with an osteoporosis drug. Uh, again, manufacturing of chemicals, especially complex chemicals that involve a lot of components, often sourced from, from component suppliers, uh, raise a whole lot of considerations for the manufacturer of that chemical product, uh, especially a medicine. Uh, medicines are also uh, regulated under the FDA. They require certain levels of approval. Um, in this particular Fosamax case, there it was a warning label issue. Um, and the, the side effect concern was that there would be an increased risk of hip fractures uh, so that was something that that went into litigation because the argument was that uh, based on the known properties of the uh, chemical makeup of that drug, 
and its interaction with the body that it should have been reasonably foreseeable that there was an increased risk of hip fractures. Uh, I cite the Wendell case. This is expert testimony. Uh, and again, I'm running low on time, so I don't want to talk about it uh, too long here. But one of the things that uh, commonly pops up in product liability cases uh, is the issue of a proof of case by expert testimony. Uh, a plaintiff will often have an expert in the field talk about the particular design of a product, talk about the prevailing knowledge that was known in the field at the time the product was designed or manufactured or placed on the market. Um, uh, also, you often will have uh, in manufacturing defect cases, the potential for a manufacturing expert to talk about proper manufacturing and inspection and testing processes. Uh, again, what the plaintiff is, is attempting to do is show that there was a defect, again, in how the product was manufactured, designed, uh, tested, uh, or inspected before it went to market. Um, so in this particular case, it had to do with a, um, uh, the use of a particular drug uh, and the potential risk of a drug interaction problem when combined with other drugs. Uh, I cite here the um, issue about uh, labeling. Again, FDA was involved uh, because we were dealing with a medicine. Uh, in this particular case, the pharmaceutical manufacturer won uh, and got the case initially dismissed because the plaintiffs did not provide admissible expert evidence of causation. In other words, they didn't have an expert properly substantiate their claim that this was a drug interaction. Um, now, the appellate division reversed that determination, um, indicating that what we were dealing with was, in fact, a rare cancer. And so it was not entirely surprising that the scientific community did not have a full raft of data on that uh, and investigating it. So that would, has revived that case. Uh, and that is, to my knowledge, still in litigation yet. It hasn't quite been resolved. Uh, C-STAR I put in here as well. This involves a mechanical issue. The, the ball joint at the end of a rod on a steering system on a boat failed. Uh, that resulted in a loss of steering. Plaintiff was ultimately ejected from the boat. Um, a lot of this focused on what I had talked about before on the concept of causation uh, and uh, arguments about whether uh, there have been proper warnings in the literature. Uh, interestingly, in this case, no one had actually read the manual. Uh, I find as an attorney, it's very difficult to make a claim of failure to warn and the impact of a failure to warn if, in fact, the end user does not take the step of reading the product instructions. Um, and as noted here in the case, uh, the plaintiff could not prove that inadequate warnings in the manual were a proximate cause of the injuries because they had simply not reviewed that manual. Uh, they could only show, quote unquote, something was wrong, the rod end failed, which in this case was inadequate to show that there was a design defect. Uh, I'd cited one last case. Um, I will say it was a Bristol Myers Squibb case. It's on jurisdiction. This is kind of where litigators geek out a bit. Uh, it has to do with where a claim can be brought. Um, so I don't think we uh, we really need to get into that. Uh, if there are any questions at this point, uh, let me know. I, we haven't gotten any questions to date. So, uh, you know, with that, I'm, I'm happy to represent to you that if anybody has questions at a later point in time, they can get a hold of me. Um, I will uh, also note that Bond Shutting King um, has the ability to do kind of a proactive product liability audit, uh, which we've done for some manufacturers in the past. Uh, so if you have questions and want us to take kind of a deeper look uh, at a particular product design or a particular product uh, set of warnings or something like that, we're, we're certainly open to uh, being able to do that. Uh, with that, I, I don't see that any questions have been submitted. I, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you guys today about uh, product liability law. Uh, again, I invite you, if you, if you have any questions later on, um, uh, please let me know. With that, I think I'm, I'm turning it over to Kathy Purdy, and I give my thanks to her for, for the uh, technical aspects of this webinar. Thank you again.